the little mundane things in life, the unimportant things, we do not have value for them. And she goes, it goes so fast. Hi, you're watching Storio, where storytellers disrupt. I am Fabiano Altamora. I did it normally that time. And I'm David (laughs) Nororonia. I love our intros, dude. I mean, I don't know if other people do, but it makes me smile. We tickle ourselves. It makes me smile. And before we get started, please remember to like, subscribe, follow, and give us that five-star review. Brother, I'm excited to connect with you because occasionally you and I get the privilege of directing. And when yeah. I was doing Little Women uh, in season one, uh, we talked about directing. But yep. you're actually directing a beautiful, classic American play mm-hmm. at Bethel Conservatory of the Arts. What's What project? are you working on right now? So I am doing Our Town by Thornton Wilder. Okay. And for those of us that might not be familiar, I mean, I don't know where you've been living. Uh, yeah. If you're not familiar planet, with it. Yeah. But maybe if you're in an international, I mean, this is, I think it's, I think you shared with me the other day, it's maybe the most performed American play in the United States. It is. Yeah. I remember reading an article, I think over, I don't know if it's up to this point, but up to the point I was reading um, over 10 years and it might've been up to this year, it's been performed um 4,000 times. Oh my gosh. So that's like 400 venues a year are putting on this play. So I've, okay. So first of all, for those that may not know, what's yep. kind of the log line or quick summary of the play? What is it about? It's very interesting. So it's, it's, it's about a small town called Grover's Corners set in 1901. And it's about the lives of two families. And there were supporting characters along the way. But it shows their journey in a town of 2,600 people, I believe it is, and just how they navigate their daily lives. And the play is a span over 13 years. And it basically hits on themes like love Mm. and marriage, companionship. Mm. There's no definitive antagonist in the play like what makes a really good story I'm not saying this is a bad story obviously it isn't it won a pulitzer mm-hmm. um but it's about the journey of the life of these two families the webs and the gibbs and then their children when they get married and then what ultimately happens in their marriage it, it moves in and out of time so the beauty of the play is and i've not given you a full log line there because to be completely honest i don't know what it sounds the, like it's portraiture in a way that we're getting yeah. a glimpse into this town, these families, and these just simple human rite of passage type moments. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then there's a massive twist at the end. Yeah, which is the, is the twist at the end, which if, you know, I mean, spoiler alert, but you know, the protagonist or one of the protagonists dies and gets the opportunity to go back. Wow. And then she forms a kind of, I would say, the main event of the play, Mm. which I'm really exploring, which we'll go into a little bit more, but it's like that of regret and the misuse of time. So already what stands out to me, but I'm curious how you would respond to this, is why do you think this piece is so popular? Um, Because I think the ideas in it are universal. Um. They're so universal. And I think that Thornton Wilder, at the time that he wrote it, he was breaking a lot of traditional conventions. Like like what? Yeah, that's that's interesting to me. What, how so, was it cutting edge at the time? Having the stage manager, which is in effect the main character, mm. directly addressing the audience, what we call breaking the fourth wall, and then him being like the omniscient huh, almost god figure voice. the god the god voice where he talks as a narrator figure to the audience but then also is shooing the actors off stage when they need to be off stage right he's he's directing the story as he goes along and i think the beauty of it as well is there is absolutely hardly any set Very minimalist. And there are no props. Everything is pantomimed. And I think what Thornton Wilder was trying to do is like focus everything back 
onto the acting yeah so that the audience can see that it's unapologetically theatrical you know you are watching a piece of theater mm -hmm. it doesn't try and you know it's not pretending. like a shakespeare piece no pretending but the the scenes are so simple normal and mundane thornton wilder calls them unimportant which is so ironic unimportant well that's very rule breaking right because that one of the first rules of story yep is that it's a series of meaningful events so the very fact yep. that he's kind of flipping off convention and saying yep. no i'm actually going to pick things that are not important yep of course the irony is is i would imagine clearly if it's mm -hmm. been performed mm -hmm. four thousand times that it must be meaningful and important in some way because audiences keep coming to watch this story to watch it because i think it mirrors real life yeah even though it isn't real life and even though you have the narrator that basically just gives you a ton of exposition mm. um when you are in the moments of real life you'd be like that's exactly the same conversation i had at home with my wife the other night which, which is insane it tells you how well it's written because when 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 did this piece debut when was it originally i think it was in the i think it was in the 30s i think it was 1937 but i could be wrong no so think about this i mean listen even if it was early last last century think about the state of theater at that point was we probably had the busby berkeley musicals and spectacles right there was mm -hmm, that whole mm -hmm. uh, uh thing it sounds to me and I, I haven't done a deep dive on this particular piece that thornton wilder was also maybe reacting and responding potentially to the theater mm -hmm. of his time yeah because if it won a pulitzer prize there must have been something very novel and oh, unique of about Absolutely. about the piece mm -hmm. um and so i wonder if he was just going against convention at the time mm -hmm. um and frankly what you're describing to me sounds like episodic tv where mm -hmm. where shifts and change are impressionistic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh incremental mm -hmm. very subtle and mm -hmm. almost hyper naturalistic which i would have to think this is pre-method pre, -method, pre mm -hmm. um you know this style of acting mm -hmm. i would have to imagine uh th th this was very groundbreaking for its time yeah, and I think that, you know, like you get a lot of these great arts. I mean, like Stanislavski. Yeah. He was breaking the convention of his time, you know, because it was too Brechtian signposted, right? Mm -hmm. So he broke the convention. I think Thornton Wilder was breaking it. And as a play, mm -hmm. like if you look at Chekhov, right, the plays don't necessarily read well. Chekhov sounds like he was doing the same thing, by the way. Yeah. This sounds incredibly similar to what Thornton Absol Wilder absolutely. was. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They don't read well. I'm not saying it's bad writing, yeah. but what's on the page is not what being, what's being said. Right. With this as well, I think you have to, you have to see it yeah. to really be moved by it. Until you get to the third act, when you're in the third act, everybody is, is emotional and taken away. But what I wanted to do with it with rather than exploring the main themes, because I've seen it a lot of times and people lean into the naturalism of it. People lean into the love, the marriage, and I'm not trying to circumnavigate any of those sure. themes, but the theme, the biggest theme for me that leaped out more than anything was the theme of time. Wow. So what does that look like? for you give us a couple of glimpses of so then what how are you exploring time as a theme in your approach so there's no antagonist in the play yeah but my antagonist is time how so how is time an antagonist because what happens at the end of the play again spoiler alert but you have emily who dies when she's delivering her second child and there's a funeral scene and all the people that have passed including her are in this funeral scene mm. and she has the monologue which becomes the main event of the play which is humans don't see each other mm. humans are not present in the moment the sunset the sunrise the little mundane things in life the unimportant things we do not have value for them and she goes it goes so fast mm. See that right there, the idea that we squander time, right? we squander precious moments. I don't know because it is true that when it's happening, when mm -hmm. you're raising your kids, you know, your first 50 dates with your wife or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you think this is the problem with human beings. We think we have all the time in the world 
and we believe that it's guaranteed us honestly. Right. Otherwise, I mean, I don't know how we get out of bed. So mm -hmm. there is that, that, that tension, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I've got to believe I'm going to wake up tomorrow. Other, mm -hmm. you know, in the same respect, we have to have this, this, we have to be in this, in this tension and mm -hmm. this tug of war of I'm going to live and I'm going to pursue things as if I've got another 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. And yet I should notice that sunset. Mm -hmm. I should kiss my wife. Right. I should read to my daughter. Every single moment. There's a scene in the play where they're just talking. There's one family that's, she's a little bit more aspirational. You know, she wants to mm. sell this big armoire that she's been offered $350 for because she wants to go to France, oh. Paris. Um, but there's a scene where they're literally just de-stringing beans. Mm. And I think what Thornton Wilde and his genius was saying is like, I've made this mundane and unimportant so that while you paid for these tickets, you can look and sit, watch real life in quote marks and just sit and be, mm -hmm. right? And I think the value of that, when you get to the end, what happens is you, you then, in the moment, you can be like, I'm a bit bored about this. But then when you get to the end, it makes you reevaluate the last two right. hours that then you leave going, I am never going to squander time again. And that's what I want to sucker punch the audience with. It's like, do not squander your time. Because one thing is guaranteed. Everybody has the same currency in the world, which is we have 24 hours in one given day. We just don't know how many given days we have. Mm -hmm. So for the given days that you do have, make them count. You know, it reminds me of the moment in Sixth Sense mm -hmm. where, and there's several movies that kind of play with this idea that you think you're watching one kind of story. Mm -hmm. And then you come to the climactic pivotal point mm -hmm. and everything turns and the author has somehow pulled off this thing yep. where he, he gets you. Yep. There's a gotcha moment where you go, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm so disoriented right now. I, th I just thought I was watching a whole story about this and now I'm realizing, and that, that is very, very masterful because to pull that off well, to keep the audience yeah, engaged absolutely. and to, to risk being quote unquote mundane, although I'm, I'm sure that it, there's going to, it's going to be lovely portraiture and all these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Um, that, that's a, that's a masterful writer. The other thing that stood out to me that you mentioned earlier, which is really kind of just beautiful and odd and must've been so cutting edge for the time is this idea of playing naturalistic theatrical moments whilst assigning the role of the narrator mm -hmm. to one of the most theatrical roles in theater, which right. is the stage yeah. manager. Yeah. He's just, he just seems like he's a master just playing with all kinds of expectations. Yeah. He's the God figure. And like, you know, back in, you know, classical theater, be like the Greek chorus. Right. You know what I mean? But I think for me, when I'm, when I'm looking at a piece, because I, I do like to break convention when I direct. Yeah, you know, so how are you approaching the piece? Because I know that you have an interesting approach, so just like you did with yeah. Crucible. Yeah, so I don't ever really like to set pieces in their original time yeah. because I'm discussing the, the stewardship of time. Mm. If you set it too far back, if you set it in 1901, people are not going to be able to necessarily relate to it do you think it's like too far it's removed? way too okay. far removed so initially i was going to set it in the 50s mm -hmm. you know after the second world war there's that whole you know it's it's a new era now it's a beautiful then time. i thought it's still too far mm -hmm. away so i decided to set it in 1985 wow and i had this idea of how back to the future plays with going back and forth in time this feels like a theatrical version of that Although it is. Are you going to kick off with Huey Lewis in the news? Yes, I am. Absolutely. Gonna, that's the opener. And um, I'm setting it because it's not so far back that people can't relate to it. And the fashion sense still is very relevant now. 100%. You know what I mean? Even though the dialogue is still quite sure. old in some ways, um, I've set it in the 80s because I think that can still be... It's actually Relevant. quite clever man, yeah. because with Stranger Things, yep. there's been a whole, and I mean, the 80s have been a around reboot, now yeah. for like a good five, 10 years, but with Stranger Things mm -hmm. and the soundtracks and music coming out of that, it seems like actually it's 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 the perfect moment in recent history, history to, kind to, of to do that. And I think it's because it's very, you know, on Vogue right now. And I just, when I pitched it to our students, they were like, why the heck are we doing our town? It's so boring. Really? But I said a lot, a, well, you know, I hear say I'd heard that from people, <laughs> but I, um, 
I then went into the nuts and bolts because I think one thing for me is I love the nuance. I love mm-hmm. really mining the text. And I just pitched them it and they, they got really excited. And I'm really excited to put this on in our black box mm-hmm. where it's somewhat, you know, Thornton Wilder was exploring with this immersive type of theater, even though I wouldn't say it's true immersion. But I think that it's going to be really good for anybody that can buy tickets to come and see it mm. because seeing a new take on a classical piece, oh, it's always fun. adding an element of modernity to it, mm. I think is going to be so much fun. What, it, what, um, how has, how has, I know that you're at the beginning stages of directing this, but I mean, often when we dig into something as an artist, the piece does something to us. It begins to change us in some way. We're affected by the piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, we grow, we learn something. What's surprised you? What has, what has caught you mm-hmm. about this piece and how is it affecting you? I think that having become an empty nester, mm. it's more real to me now because even though I knew I was directing the play, going through that whole thing with my with my son leaving, my daughter being out the house, has made me realize that I am going to be as present as I can possibly be. And I am going to sap every single bit of life that I can get out of the time and pray I have another 40, 50 years here, but I'm not going to squander it anymore. Like my times, like, you know, right now I'm, going to be doing a bodybuilding contest quite soon and we're going to have a very special episode a very special episode yeah the producers and i jesse and i she's off camera you don't know jesse but we're we're gonna we're gonna whip up a very very special episode am i gonna do the entire episode with my shirt i mean there's definitely going to be some graphical photographical <laughs> representations of this before and after that's 100 percent. i believe it's going to go viral and it's not a speedo it's a board short just so you know <laughs> but i think being at this phase of life for me has made the play come alive more than ever. And I want this to say to the audience, do not squander the time you have with your kids. And no matter how hard it is, really freaking live life to the full while you can. I love it, man. I don't, I don't think that message will ever, uh, ever not be relevant. Um, where will people be able to, and when will they be able to see this if they're in town? Um, you will be able to buy tickets. We can put the link right. in the comments and um, it's going to be in Reading mm-hmm. at um, our East Street, uh, at our 1040 Locust Street Theater, mm-hmm. but we'll put all the descriptions and dates in, and, the t- dates information and times, and everything. everything. Awesome. In, if you're so in town, I highly, highly encourage you. I mean, if you've never seen Black Box Theater, it's so incredibly intimate. You're just a few feet away from the actors. You can hear them breathe. Um, you, it's almost like being in close up. It's yeah, like a yeah, beautiful absolutely mixture between theater and film in a way mm-hmm. because you're, you're just so intimate and so close well man i always get excited when you uh when you direct um fab never leaves any rock on unturned and always tries to approach a piece in, an, in a new and cutting edge way you did it with the crucible man and i'm looking forward to seeing our thanks town. bro i'm excited Guys, it's been great to hang out with you on Storia. Please remember to like, subscribe, give us that five-star review. And if you're in town in Reading, check out the links below and buy a ticket to our town at Bethel Conservatory of the Arts. See you soon.